There is still a reasonable number of people that disagree with what I say in some of my videos. So I'd like to explain a concept because I think this will be really useful in why I think it is that some people still persistently do not agree with some of what I say when I'm talking about the law. Because the law applies in a very intrinsic way and with all respect to those people, that is why you should seek the advice from a lawyer if ever you want to rely on any of these principles because it might apply very slightly differently in your case to another case that might be very, very slightly factually different. So welcome back, I am the Black Belt Barrister helping you to understand law. In this video, I'm going to focus on one of the sort of principles or philosophies that I believe applies, which sort of warps and twists people's understanding of the law and how the law applies. So specifically, I'm talking about the scenario when I talked about if you're in a supermarket, it is theft to be eating something before you've paid for it. The reasoning and the principle behind that is that you do not yet own it. Now, the confusion has come about because a lot of people think that unless you've got the intention to permanently deprive the other person of the thing, then it can't be theft because that's one of the elements of theft. And I say one of the elements of theft because there are a number of elements and they are provable in a number of different ways. The few scenarios that make this fairly unique include when you're eating something in a supermarket that you haven't yet paid for or you're eating a meal in a restaurant that you haven't yet paid for, or you are putting fuel into your vehicle that you haven't yet paid for. Let's take those in reverse order, but please stick around because I'm going to explain this philosophy, which is why I think a lot of people misunderstand this and get it wrong. So let's start with the example of fuel. There is a specific offence that relates to things like fuel, which is making off without payment. That is where payment is required on the spot, and this is contained within Section 3 of the Theft Act 1970. 78, not 1968. That is where payment is required on the spot. If you dishonestly make off without having made that payment, then you're guilty of an offence. Although you do put the fuel in your car first. Now I've heard various comments such as, how can you steal something when you've already put it into your car and you've sort of taken ownership of it and so on and so forth. The reasoning behind that is that this is a separate offence. It's been slightly defined differently than the rest because everybody knows at least in England and Wales I know it's different internationally sometimes you pay for the fuel before you put it in and even in some petrol stations around the UK they require you to make a payment up front and if you're using a card they pre-authorize your card by a hundred pounds that's a tangent I'll come back to in just a moment so most of the time you might be pre-authorizing a card to make payment but if you haven't done that payment is required on the spot therefore it is a separate offense to be making off without payment if you know that payment is required on the spot. And this includes, in my opinion, for what it's worth, and I am a barrister, so I'm allowed to have a legal opinion. What my opinion is on this is that if you know that the shop doesn't accept a certain form of payment and you say, well, there it is, and it's just tough if you don't accept it, and then they make off, I think that's dishonest because they know that payment in that form is not accepted. So that could be whether they don't accept cards or they don't accept commemorative coins or stamps or whatever it might be that might otherwise form legal tender. I've talked about legal tender in other videos that is not applying in the way that people think it is, such as a shop, even though you are technically creating a debt when you're at the point of sale the legal tender doesn't apply in the same way. It only applies by paying it into court as a defense or by offering it to settle a judgment against you. But by the by, that's the fuel scenario. Coming back to, let's say, let's go in reverse order. Let's talk about the restaurant. There's an implied term and formation of contract when you sit down at a restaurant, you're given a menu, you order at the table. The contract is formed at the restaurant because you order the food and you know that payment is required at the end of the meal. So you're forming this contract. If on the other hand, it's a counter and you go and pay for it and then they deliver it to you, of course, you're just paying it up front. That's very slightly different. Either way, it's still a contract and you still have to pay for the food. If you think the food was absolutely rubbish, then you should make that absolutely clear and you should at the very least give them your details so that you're not just dishonestly disappearing so they can't track you. But you can dispute the bill at a restaurant if you think that the food was poor quality. Because ultimately the principle of the contract in a restaurant is really the service of cooking the food. 
Otherwise, it's just a raw chicken breast or whatever kind of food it might be. You're clearly not paying just for the chicken breast, you're paying for the service. The court would take the view that the main principle of this contract is the preparation of the food. You know, what style is it cooked in and how is it cooked and how well is it cooked and all of these kind of things. So the main principle of the contract is the service and therefore it should be with reasonable skill and care. And if it's not, then it could be a breach of contract and you could dispute it. Some people take the view that you have to pay the bill no matter what, and that's not quite true. Let's get back to the scenario where you are in a supermarket and you are eating food that you haven't yet paid for. Now, the principle behind this is that you do not yet own the food or the drink or whatever it is that you are consuming. But by consuming it, it's similar in a sense to putting fuel in your car in that they can't really take it back. They could, I suppose, but it'd be quite difficult for them to take it back. With the food, it's impossible. You have deprived the owner of it, i.e. the shop. You've deprived them of their rights at the point that you consume it. I've had some very funny comments that you could somehow leave it for them a little bit later, but obviously that's not going to happen. That You've deprived them of their rights for that food or drink or whatever it might be. They can no longer do anything with it. They can't sell it, they can't change the price. You've deprived them of their rights. And by doing so, you've treated it as though you are the owner. And because you've treated it as though you are the owner, you have under Section 6 of the Theft Act 1968, which some people still don't seem to think applies. But trust me, I'm a barrister, it applies. Section 6 of the Theft Act 1968 provides a person appropriating property belonging to another without meaning the other permanently to lose the thing itself is nevertheless regarded as having the intention of permanently depriving the other of it if his intention is to treat the thing as his own and dispose of it regardless of the other's rights. Now, taking this analysis one step further, a lot of people say, well, it can't be theft because it's not dishonest, because they're willing to pay for it. Well, that's clarified and cleared up by section two, subsection two of the Theft Act of 1968, because it provides that a person's appropriation of property belonging to another may be dishonest, notwithstanding that he's willing to pay for the property. So it doesn't matter if they are prepared to pay for it, it can still be dishonest. Now granted, this is an objective test if it ever ends up in court. If being the operative word, which is the principle, remember that I'm going to come back to at the end of this, because there is some principle that applies in all these scenarios, but I'm going to come back to that. But if on an objective assessment, people did take the view that it was dishonest, notwithstanding they were prepared to pay for it, and they treated it as the owner, therefore they have permanently deprived the person of it, and by eating it, deprived the shop of its rights, and so on. That is clearly taken to be with the intention to permanently deprive, because they've deprived the owner of its rights. Therefore, on an objective test, it is quite clearly theft. Now, somebody also in the comments, which I like to read and respond to your comments, hence the follow-up video, some people did say, well, ask any random 12 people and they will say that it's not dishonest. However, and once again, that's where I beg to differ. I did a poll, actually two polls on my channel, for this specific purpose. I wanted to see if enough people responded on an objective, i.e. what would a reasonable, honest person think? Do they think this is dishonest? Do you think this is dishonest? So thank you if you took part in any of these polls. The first one was a straightforward question. Is it theft to eat food in a supermarket before paying it? And secondly, I went into a bit more detail on what would have been jury directions. So I said, you're the jury. Is it dishonest to eat food in a supermarket before you've paid for it? The defendant is charged with theft by consumption. The jury would be directions are that theft elements are dishonest appropriation of property belonging to another with the intention to permanently deprive the person of it. The second direction being dishonesty is an objective test, not what the defendant thought, but what does a reasonable honest person think is dishonest. This was decided very broadly in Ivy and Genting Casinos in 2017 pretty much turning on its head what we have used to determine dishonest behaviour for more than 20 odd years. The third direction, of course, is that it may still be dishonest even if the defendant's willing to pay, which is section 2.2 of the Theft Act. 
The direction four is if the defendant hasn't yet paid, it still belongs to someone else, it belongs to the store. Direction five, if the defendants treat it as though they are the owner and dispose of it, i.e. consume it, they've permanently deprived the owner of it. And that, I say, is under section six of the Theft Act. What was really interesting is in the first very simple question, is it theft to eat food in a supermarket? 14,000 of you responded, out of which 66% said, yes, it's theft, i.e. it is theft to eat food in a supermarket before you've paid for it. Therefore, I suggest to you on a poll for an objective test of 14,000 of you, 66% would have convicted this defendant of theft for eating the food in the supermarket. The second poll, with more detailed would-be jury directions, 9,800 of you voted, and once again, very, very close, 65% of you said guilty, i.e. they are guilty of theft for eating food in a supermarket. I suggest to all of you that disagree that 14,000 of you and then 9,800 of you would have, on a majority, convicted this defendant of eating food in a supermarket. However, that's not the end of the story because the principle finally that I wanted to talk to you about is what I call system and reality. The system, if you like, is the set of rules, the set of procedures, the way things are designed to work, the way things, according to the book, literally, literally, according to the book, this is Archbold, one of our criminal procedure rules book. It is a very detailed book that we need to be familiar with. And there's two books for civil, there's one for family, and there's one for everything else. Literally, according to the book, that's how things are supposed to work. Reality, on the other hand, this also goes for the same analogy of shoplifting and leaving the store before it's considered shoplifting. Most of you believed that you have to leave the shop first. And there is a reason for that. The reality differs from the system on many occasions. So many supermarkets are not going to bother you and pester you before you've left the shop. Partly because it's easier to prove that you were intending to steal the thing if you're outside the shop first. Partly just because they don't want to harass every customer because they've got something in their pocket or in a bag or something like that. That's the reality of it. The reality of it is it's easier to prosecute you if you've left the shop because there's virtually no doubt then unless it's a pure accident and they can prove that it was a pure accident. I'll come back to an example of that in a minute. But it's easier to prove than if you've just got it in your pocket and you're in a shop. Likewise, consumption of food in the supermarket as well. Most supermarkets are probably not going to hassle you if you're chomping on something around the supermarket. Most people, as it happens, 14,000 and 9,800, most people don't approve of this behavior. I don't really approve of the behavior. I wouldn't do it. If anything, when I've done that, I've been desperately thirsty, I will take it, pay for it, keep the receipt, and then I'll drink it when I'm walking around the store. But I've got the receipt, so if I am challenged, I can say I've got the receipt here, so I've already paid for it. So I would do it that way around. Most people seem to agree with that. Most people wouldn't chomp on something halfway around the supermarket. The reality often differs from the system. The reality is most supermarkets are not going to challenge you if you're eating something, but I would be very surprised if one of them isn't sort of following you around to make sure that you do ultimately pay for it. I've personally seen somebody challenged because they were eating something, they put the wrapper down somewhere and clearly didn't have any intention of paying for it, and they were challenged by one of the members of staff because they got to the checkouts and they didn't have the wrapper with them and quite clearly they'd planned to steal it. So there it is, system and reality. The reality is there's a human element to all this. The shops have obviously got a certain way that they want to deal with customers. They don't want to ostracize every customer because there's a possibility that they might be doing something wrong. And yet they do obviously want to protect themselves from theft and everything else. But as I've heard it directly from witnesses before, it is service first, then security. Shops tend to put the customer service first before the security of the store. It's a security system within a customer service area, not the other way around. And so that's the reality of it. That is by no means any encouragement for you to go about and do this because you think you'll get away with it. Because whilst some people do sometimes get away with it, 
when you get caught for it, it is a dishonesty offence. It has a serious repercussion on the rest of your lives. Now, a few exceptions, which I said I would come back to, if you've got a shopping trolley full of stuff that you have paid for and you've missed one item and it's fairly insignificant, I don't really think the shop is going to call the police and try to charge you with shoplifting if that's the case. Whereas, on the other hand, if it's several expensive items that have been stashed and concealed somewhere in a coat or what have you, then yes, the shop is most likely to try to call the police to get them to prosecute you. Interesting example, the most brazen example of shoplifting I've ever seen was CCTV footage of a man walked into a shop, walked the full length of the store, full length because the alcohol is on the far end of the store on the other side, obviously because it's more expensive. He picked up two bottles of whiskey, one in each hand, and walked back the full length of the store and then ran off. And of course, security guards came after him, called the police and so on and so forth. Another example that will fit in with my reality situation as opposed to security is where let's say somebody's diabetic and they just have to eat something there and then otherwise they're going to go into hypoglycemic shock. That being the case, again, I very much doubt the shop is going to get angry at you and call the police and so on because you're chomping on something because you want to avoid the risk of being seriously ill. I hope that serves to explain and clarify lots of things. And as I say, that is why you always really need to speak to a lawyer if any of this ever applies to you, and that is why none of this can ever seek to be legal advice. It's only guidance, it's to help to demystify the law for you, to help you understand it, but ultimately, if you get caught in these situations, please, please seek legal advice. It doesn't make you look guilty. You have the right to free legal advice if you are questioned about a crime, your involvement with an offence, so always take advantage of it. With that, please leave me more questions and comments so I can get back to those as well. Like the video, share it, and subscribe, and thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.